I am so happy to introduce Heidi Gardner, who is joining us from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and our drawing scientist, Julius Chitten. And without further ado, I will hand it over to both of them. Awesome. Well, um, thank you very much, Kate, uh, for that great introduction. I am Julius. I'm joining from uh, what is now Edmonton in Alberta, actually, a little farther from the coast, from the borders of the um, lands of the uh, Cree Nation, the Muskego Sik, the Enoch Cree Nation. And we have some wonderful forest that uh, I can see from my place here uh, on their land. So the conservation of our, our natural uh, ecosystems here has been doing done so much better by First Nations than by uh, European colonists, I have to say. Um, and I am really excited today to be uh, here to draw a salmon shark with all of you. And I'm also really excited that we're joined by Heidi Gartner because uh, we've just been kind of geeking out back and forth a little bit before this about uh, deep ocean and ocean biology and conservation. And this is something that I think is, is dear to um, uh, many of our hearts, but few people are as familiar with it as we should be, and there's lots to learn. And so actually, um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Heidi for her introduction uh, to uh, her expertise in this area as well. Thanks, Julius. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, my name is Heidi, and I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So I work and live on the traditional territories of the Wasanic people. Um, but I'm a deep ocean biologist. So I go out off the west coast of British Columbia um, and work in the traditional territories of many of our coastal First Nations. And yeah, I'm excited to talk to you all today. I am not a shark expert, but I am someone who gets to go out and study the deep sea, which is anywhere kind of over 200 meters below the ocean surface. And we get to go in on large vessels to get out there. And we've had some really cool opportunities to see sharks while we're out doing our research. So that's what I'm gonna share with you today is one of our cool experiences being our study animal, the salmon shark. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and did you and, and would you like to actually say some more about that, that sighting you had there? Um, and just to, just to get people familiar with this, just uh, salmon sharks in general are, are in a group of sharks called the mackerel sharks. Uh, they are really streamlined sharks, but beautifully evolved for long oceanic swims. Uh, they're open ocean animals and uh, they look like great whites, like mini great whites. Uh, they're beautiful animals, as we'll see. And um, uh, Heidi and her research team have had some wonderful opportunities to observe them with some interesting behavior as well. So why don't you say something uh, more about what, what you've been able to observe with salmon sharks, Heidi? Awesome. That sounds great. Yeah, so we go out as a team of researchers, and my job at Fisheries and Oceans Canada is to provide science advice for conservation and monitoring and management of the deep ocean. And we've been going out to large marine protected areas, also called um, MPAs, that are off of the west coast of Vancouver Island and Haida Gwaii. And we work with the coastal First Nations who are co-managing these areas with uh, the government of Canada to do research to learn more about them. We are still learning so much about our deep sea. There's this really interesting statistic that we now know more about the surface of Mars than we do our own deep oceans. And that's just kind of mind boggling to me. So we go out and we take these robots called uh, remotely operated vehicles and we send them underneath the ocean surface and they collect video and imagery and sometimes they have manipulators or little arms on them that can help us collect specimens of animals and so working together we're going out to learn more about our ocean we study things like sea mounts so sea mounts are mountains underwater and they have to be over a thousand meters tall to be classified as a sea mount and just to let you know how exciting it is to be in this work field that here in Canada about six years ago we thought we had 20 sea mounts and we now know we have 65. So this is something that is over a thousand meters tall below the ocean surface. We didn't even know those were there, let alone all the cool animals living on them. So what I'm gonna actually show you is a really cool video is we get to go out on these research vessels and we get to live on them. And for two to three weeks at a time, we work with these robots and we send them under the water. 
but we also do work like collecting and deploying oceanographic um, tools. So these are tools that go out and study like what's happening in the water column, how cold it is, how warm it is. And what you're going to see is my colleagues were deploying one of these pieces of uh, tools when they saw a salmon shark. And not only did they see a salmon shark, but they saw it doing this very strange behavior. And I'll let you tell them tell you about it. So I'm gonna actually show you a little video here and hopefully it works with sound because it's pretty talking about the excitement that they have. So Julius, how's it looking so far? I see it, yeah. Uh, it's, it's the... Um... Oh, here we go. Yes, I can see now, just like it was before the video. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry for us now. Is this a salmon shark? Yes. So we got a two meter male salmon shark. We were out there deploying a couple of gliders. We noticed that it started brushing itself on this log over and over again. Whoa. It looked like it was aiming for like these big clumps of barnacles, and then it would heave its body out of the water and actually slide it along. That is so cool. Oh, that's where his parasites are. Those are the tags. It's really interesting that these logs out at sea may be scratchy posts for them to rid themselves of parasites. So we were observing an animal in the wild doing what it naturally does, and it didn't seem to be bothered by us at all. As far as I know, this footage doesn't exist elsewhere. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> So now you actually have seen your salmon shark swimming, which is cool. But that behavior you were observing was very strange. No, we um, looked through traditional knowledge of our Indigenous colleagues, no records through oral stories or any written stories. We checked through scientific literature. There's evidence of shark scratching, but more on like natural substrates, like up on beaches and certain things. So this was the first time that we had seen this kind of out in the wild uh, with like floating kind of human debris and garbage. And actually we ended up seeing the next year, someone, uh, another shark doing it on fiberglass. So like a piece of a boat floating. And I just wanted to share one really cool aspect because we're drawing today, but our colleague um, that you saw in that video, um, Howith Wayans, also known as Joshua Watts, is an indigenous artist. And we were writing this paper about our scientific discovery and we were gonna do a drawing about, you know, this is where the shark was. There was those little parasites you saw and we're gonna hear about that today. And um, he actually did a field note drawing in the style of the Nichalis people. And I just thought that was a really cool part to add to kind of different ways that people see the world and, and share the stories of um, animals and science. And I'm excited for us to be doing another type of drawing today. So I think for now, I'll pass back to Julia, but you can, Ask me anything. <laughs> I was just looking at the uh, um, at that drawing that Joshua did uh, on in the paper there, and it's really nice that it's actually published in the paper. Uh, pretty awesome to see that. And so, yeah, um, thank you for that video. That was exciting. I love to see sharks in the wild. Uh, videos of them, photographs of them. It just gets me so excited. Uh, sharks are one of my favorite animals, uh, and that's saying a lot for me. So uh, drawing sharks has always been something I've loved to do. I've um, illustrated books on sharks. Uh, recently, I got to work with uh, a, a world-renowned paleoecologist to do a book on sharks or add some images. So it just really excites me. So to do a drawing of a shark today is super, super fun for me. And so I'm really happy that everybody has been able to join. And so um, without further ado, let's get started with drawing the salmon shark. So you guys got to see, and this is really neat because usually in our draw, learn to draw webinars, we don't usually get to see such great video of the animal that we're drawing. And so now we've had kind of a, a taste of, of how it looks, how it moves, and some very cool, unusual behavior of uh, using a scratching post in the, in the ocean, basically. So this will actually help us in our drawing because we've got an idea of what it looks like. So I'm going to share my screen. And I have prepared a preview of what we're going to be doing here. And hopefully you'll be able to see this in a second. Um, oops. Is it working? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Should be coming up now. My computer's a little bit slow, so hopefully it works okay <laughs> with the connection. Okay. Can you guys see that all right? Okay, super. 
Good. So this is the um, animal that we just saw in that video. It's a beautifully streamlined shark. Sharks uh, come in such a wide var variety of shapes and sizes and colors. They are an incredibly ancient group of animals. They are uh, something over 400 million years in the making, basically, uh, in evolution. They've been evolving for a very, very long time. And right now we have living over 550 kinds of sharks in the world. And some of them, unfortunately, are very critically endangered. So some of them are teetering on the edge of existence. And hopefully we won't lose uh, more of them. And it, 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 it pains me to see that some of them are in trouble. The salmon shark, fortunately, currently is not one of those that's in great trouble because its populations seem to be rebounding again after there has been an enormous amount of fishing in the 50s and 60s. And so now, ever since the early 90s, when protections were started to be put in place, and they limited the kind of, of drift nets that could be left in place in the ocean to catch animals like the sharks, uh, now they can't be longer than two and a half kilometers, which is insanely long, I think, anyway. And nets are a very big danger to sea life. Uh, but their populations are coming back now. So they're still fishing of salmon sharks. They are eaten. But at the same time, they're starting to get a better population. So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn off this preview of the image. You can use a paper or if you're into doing digital artwork, that's fine. I've set this up to make it a sort of a eight and a half by 11 inch size. And so that way it should work with um, with uh, whatever, hang on, let me just switch over to here, uh, work with just a regular um, letter sized page. Uh, let me get my, there we go. Oh yes, it's, sorry, it's my computer's responding a little slowly with the connection. It does this sometimes. It'll stabilize in a second, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> yes. Technology is great until it's not. Um, and sometimes technology can be a bit troublesome, but um, we're gonna get this going here. Okay, so this is our salmon shark. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start with uh, a general kind of a shape to set up the shark on the page. So you'll want to start this with very light strokes uh, of your pencil, not heavy because this is not going to stay in place the way it is. I'm going to show that by making it in, in the color red so that you can see the difference between heavy strokes or light strokes. This is light strokes, just kind of very lightly so we don't keep this. I'm going to switch off the preview and start with the actual drawing here. Okay, and so to position our drawing, I kind of like to create sort of a general shape so that we know not to go past certain areas of the page. So we leave enough space for the animal. And I like to choose uh, to draw animals in unusual perspectives or not right from the side, kind of, you know, like a just a, a regular diagram, just make it a little bit more interesting. Oh, before we go with that, though, let me just uh, point out one other thing. I was actually inspired uh, by the, uh, the news that uh, of that activity that Heidi and her team saw in 2019 of that shark. And so I actually created a coloring page that is freely available online as well, uh, featuring the salmon shark uh, scratching on a, I guess, another barnacle encrusted uh, log. This might be a piece of natural driftwood because uh, it's very likely they evolved this kind of a behavior for whatever reason, scratch and itch, remove parasites from their body, whatever. And yeah, now they're using also human made materials as scratching posts, but it's very likely they would have used regular driftwood as well. So this is an example of one. I can make this one available to us as well. Uh, and anybody is free to use this um, if they like to for coloring, for example. Um, I've got a whole page of coloring sheets this way. So the first thing we're gonna do is gonna draw this sort of disc shaped uh, shape on the page to show where our shark is going to be. Uh, and it'll help us to keep within the space requirements of the page. And so again, with light strokes, and I'm gonna put this in red to distinguish, we're going to make this, whoops, hang on. Don't worry, this is uh, just my computer being funny. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> sometimes that's it. Okay, you're gonna do this kind of a disc-like shape. It's almost like a, if you took a, like a, a lemon and squashed it down or like a, a UFO in shape or a, a, almost like a Frisbee. And um, it's 
kind of kind of symmetrical. There we go. Hopefully this will work. Good. Okay, so this is kind of just gonna set the stage for a shark's overall shape. Uh, mackerel sharks to which this species belongs are wonderfully shaped like a torpedo basically to allow them to move through the water very easily, very quickly. They're very fast swimmers. Uh, in fact, the a closer relative of this shark, the short fin mako is the fastest uh, known swimming shark and it can reach speeds over 50 kilometers an hour in the water, which is really amazing. It would actually break the speed limit in some uh, city streets uh, if it was going at full tilt. So pretty amazing. And so they do that because they have this body that is hydrodynamically efficient is what we call it. It's like with airplanes, they're aerodynamically shaped so they can move through the air without much resistance. And sharks similarly have a body shape that allows them to move through the water without much resistance. Uh, so that's actually really uh, beautiful to see. Oops, I put that in the wrong one. Okay, and so now, oh wow, my computer is being very slow. So, you know, bear with me. Uh, it, the connection is kind of funny. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start to add the details of the shark. And uh, any time that um, also um, Heidi or any of the rest of you have any interesting input about sharks or, or, or any aspect of their environment, feel free to do so because that makes it fun too. Well, one of the reasons why they need to have this super fast shape is that I'm sure we all know this, but sharks are predators and they need to be fast. And one of the really cool things about salmon sharks is they are known to travel really far distances as well. So um, they are thought to have their babies down near Baja, California. So that's down near Mexico and go all the way up to Alaska every year to feed, which is just incredible. So having this really sleek, fast shape helps them follow these salmon around, be fast enough to catch them, but also travel these long distances with not putting out as much energy as you would have if you had a big clumsy body. So that's one of the fun ways to think about it is you're, you're building the for speed today or you're drawing for speed. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and, and as you said, they're like marathon uh, runners effectively as well, traveling those huge distances. So they got to make sure that they're, they're, they're not using too much fuel along the way. Because, yeah, they got to catch the fish, but then, you know, they also got to keep up with them. So <laughs> Exactly, yeah. That's a very uh, a neat thing to be able to know about them. So we're going to put the, the sharks back in first. So this shape is kind of going to guide us. And so you're just going to follow along the top pretty much where we did from the right side with now heavier lines. So now we're going to put in the actual details. Uh, so I'm kind of looking off to the side here because my drawing tablet is here. So if you look, see me going back and forth, that's why. Um, and I'm going to start at the the right tip of that funny shape we made, that's the, the tip of the snout of the shark. And we're gonna go and basically trace along that line with a heavier line, it's kind of, my lines are not very clean here. <laughs> uh, see, I'm not a very good artist that way, but that's okay. We, uh, we're all kind of learn and however we do it, like I do a lot of sketching as well. And so usually these single long solid lines are not something that I do too often. And so it makes it a little bit Makes it look sometimes a little bit messy, but that's okay, right? Artwork is about expression, and sometimes uh, the expression isn't as clean as we would always like it to be, and that's okay. I love that saying that art is about expression, not perfection. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? Right? Yeah. You mm -hmm. have to let yourself sort of go with artwork, uh, and you come up with some wonderful kinds of uh, experiences with it. So notice that I've added, I've put the line a little bit beyond the edge of that funny shape. That's because the shark's actual body goes a little bit beyond it. That red shape was basically just a guide. So that's the back of the shark. The next thing that I'm going to add to it is the snout or the bottom of the snout. Um, so salmon sharks have this very sort of typical shark like shape, the kind of the, the cliche shark. <laughs> Basically defined by, we're all familiar with great white sharks. And I think that's probably the most familiar shark in the world. And these guys actually do look a lot like great whites, but smaller. So we're actually gonna not quite trace that line along what we did with the red line there. It kind of comes away a little bit from it. So this is underneath the snout. Sharks have these mouths that are not at the tip of their snout like most bony fish. They are what's called underslung. They're they're basically underneath the tip of the, the snout. So they have this long kind of nose-like snout. Um, and uh, the shape of that is beautiful for gliding through the water quickly. So again, it's like a torpedo, basically. 
Now we're going to add the belly. And uh, for this, I'm going to actually start near where the snout left off at the back end of it, but not right there. We're going to actually trace along the red line now. So if you go, I'm going to put this arrow. You don't have to put the arrow here, but I'm going to show you where to start drawing that line. That's over here. We're going to continue that line backward along this red guideline that we did and try to keep it as close as I can. Uh, and then again, toward the back there, we're going to sort of diverge from that shape a little bit because the shape of the shark's body is a little bit long. It, it's a bit of a longer, uh, narrower, um, more slender end than the, the shape that we made. Okay? So that's basically the overall shape of the shark. Notice how it's it's kind of spindle shaped. Um, it's like a, a it's it's all you can uh, it looks a bit like a torpedo or like a spindle. Uh, like it's I guess some stuff that we don't often use anymore. These not a lot of people know what spindles are. It has to do with weaving and and uh, and so, so anyway, these were things that would spin and would have um, string or yarn go on them, and they shape are shaped like this basically. And what we also call them is tuniform. Tuniform refers to the shape of tuna, basically. And tuna are shaped like this. They have this beautiful um, spindle-shaped body. <laughs> and it helps them to glide through the water, water very easily. So that's what we're seeing here. Now, this shark has, like others uh, that it's closely related to, a very large first dorsal fin, a dorsal fin. Dorsal refers to our back. And so there's a big fin on the back of the shark. And about halfway down, and so we're going to draw the dorsal fin, the first dorsal fin coming out of the back of the shark. And it's pretty large, actually. These fins are, uh, Heidi, what are these ones uh, the most effective for uh, in, in sharks? Oh, these ones are the ones that I think help them kind of with, um, these aren't like the power or anything like that. This is more about keeping them straight and going in the direction they need. So almost think about, uh, like a keel, I guess, on a boat, if you're a boat person, <laughs> yeah. Perfect sense, and that's it, exactly. It's um, like, you know, with an airplane, you have the tail fin, it's kind of like that. It's just kind of displaced, it's further forward. It helps to stabilize them through the water so they don't like spin as they, as they, as they swim. They can control their direction more easily uh, because these are basically, uh, they prevent, they, they show more resistance and side to side motion through the water. And so the shark can go straight forward if, as it and control its uh, swimming very well. The other thing is that they also have uh, this beautifully shaped tail fin or caudal fin. Caudal refers to tail basically. And it's just another, um, the name that we give it as biologists. The neat thing about it is now sharks have very interestingly shaped tail fins. Most sharks have a much longer upper lobe to the tail and a short lower lobe. This is called a heterocircle tail. Um, with mackerel sharks, including great whites, uh, poor beagles and salmon sharks, which are closely related to each other, and then the two mako sharks, the short fin and long fin mako shark, they have a slightly different take on the tail fin. Their upper and lower lobes are almost equal in size. And that, is perfectly logical for an animal that moves very quickly through the water. This is the kind of shape you see in tuna. Uh, in If you look at it, if you turn it sideways, the dolphins, uh, flukes are also shaped kind of symmetrically like this. Uh, and other fast moving fish, sailfish, swordfish, other kinds that move very quickly through the water. So this is a hallmark of a fast swimming animal. So we're going to draw the tail fin and it looks sort of like a, a crescent moon. And while we draw this tail fin, we have a question um, in the chat, and that is, are salmon sharks competitors for resident orcas food supply? Interesting question. Heidi, do you know, um, have you done any, have you encountered any information about that? Um, yes, in the sense of many of the sharks, especially um, the salmon shark, I know one of the the majority of their diet are things like salmon and herring and those sorts of things that yes our, our, our orcas feed on as well um not necessarily um 
for example, our salmon shark are more no more to be off of the coast as opposed to coming into, for example, the Salish Sea or something like that. And the population levels definitely are not uh, very high. This is like a transient species kind of that comes through our waters, not in super abundant things. But yes, yeah, they do eat very similar things. So that's the thing about these large sharks and these large whales or fish or whatever you want to call them. But yeah, they're the top of the the food supply or the top of the ecosystem in our ocean. And so they're usually really good indicators of how healthy our ocean is doing. So I have a feeling the person's asking this because they've heard that our resident orcas aren't necessarily doing very well. And it's because of things like overfishing and not having enough food supply available for our, our local ecosystems. So we could go down a long discussion on that, but yes, they, those good munchy teeth that I think we're going to draw soon really do love um, a lot yeah. of the fish species that we have here. And yeah, I mean, they do also eat some of the same kinds of fish, as you said, like even the Chinook salmon. Um, and the problem, though, is that Chinook salmon are also fished by us. And as you said, they're overfished. That's the big problem. There have been some suggestions that salmon sharks do affect the populations of Chinook salmon. And of course, as you said, they're apex predators. They're the top of, of, of their particular uh, food web. They, there is almost not, basically nothing is known to eat salmon sharks other than us when they're adults. When they're young, they are susceptible to being fed on by other sharks, for example. But when they're adults, they are at the top of their, their food web. And um, many sharks, as actually you guys pointed out in your paper, Heidi, many sharks are keystone species. And we talked about keystone species in other uh, drawing webinars. Uh, it uh, These are species, these are beings that are so important in their ecology, in their environment, that they their presence or absence causes a major change in the whole structure of the ecology, of the whole biological community. Uh, they very much through control, often through feeding on, on, on animals that might feed on, on other animals or plants, they can actually change the structure of their ecosystem substantially. And sharks are often like that. And so, yes, you'd expect them to change the population of fish. But as you pointed out, yeah, the, the location where they feed is, is not likely to interfere very much with our resident orcas, right? Uh, speaking of the, the tail fin, so you see this beautifully, almost symmetrical tail fin, just slightly longer upper one. There's another thing. And Heidi, you mentioned uh, a boat's keel when we were talking about the dorsal fin. Sharks, and especially salmon sharks, especially fast swimming sharks, have something that's actually called a keel as well. So they have another stabilizing feature. It's not a fin, but it's a specially developed uh, way that their body near their tail flattens out. And it functions exactly like that, like a stabilizing keel on a boat. And we're going to draw that. It's just before the tail here. I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit to show you, um, give it a little bit more detail here. And shift image over this way, center it. So there's this kind of, this area where the body flattens out. We're gonna draw this kind of a longer line near the tail. And it's, um, imagine that each side of the, the body, which basically is, is kind of in cross section, it would be kind of tall and narrow, but in this area, it, it flattens out wide. So it's like a little bit of a kind of hand, uh, sticking out at each end basically and it, it basically helps to stabilize them kind of like imagine the like you know how they have the tail fin of an airplane you have the the horizontal stabilizers in the back it's kind of a little bit like that it's extra fins kind of but built out of body instead of fins really interesting they have those and, and this is actually one of those features that i think helps tell it apart from these are sometimes a shark that's confused with like a, a baby great white. And so having these double keels on your drawing will help the experts tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. And this is important because it's so hard to tell sharks apart when you're observing them in the wild. Because you, at least from a boat, you don't see much of them. Even like you saw in the video, how from underwater, you get beautiful views of them. From above, it's really hard to tell. So any view of the shark's uh, anatomy that helps you to, to distinguish them one from the other is really important. And these ones are easily seen when the shark is, say, rubbing on that uh, log, for example. So that's kind of a neat thing, yeah. We're going to... Great, go ahead. Oh, just because you just were finishing off on that powerful tail, I just thought, especially because we're talking about movement and how it stabilizes, 
what's really neat to think about is sharks is a lot of their power actually comes from the sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the opposite of dolphins, which are sort of uh, up and down. And yeah, sharks like other ones, yeah, the sideways movement. And it's amazing when I look at them moving in the water, how little they have to move side to side to generate that that thrust uh, forward. Uh, they are really efficiently shaped. And uh, and they're very powerful, have a lot of muscles to, to cause that motion. Actually, one last, one other thing here that we need to point out where we're talking about shark movement. Uh, I have this little graphic that I created uh, for another organization with which I've also done uh, Learn to Draws, um, which is uh, uh, Sharks for Kids. Uh, and this one shows kind of a neat thing about uh, salmon sharks and other relatives like the great white and the, the makos and so on is that they have the ability to keep their body temperature higher than the water around them. And they have a very special set of blood vessels and that they're aligned with each other so that the blood that is flowing from inside the body that is warmed by these powerful muscles. These muscles are, are contracting and, and relaxing constantly as the shark moves side to side, and that generates heat. That heat normally would be lost to the water very easily, but these sharks have special blood vessels that are aligned with each other in such a way that that heat is regenerated and brought back in towards the center of the shark. That causes the shark to lose less heat, and it's effectively warm-blooded to some extent. Not fully like us, but to some extent, they can keep their body temperature higher than that of the water around them. So they use these muscles to power themselves and also to keep themselves warmer. And the importance there is that they're able to live in cold water environments, which is where salmon sharks live. They live in these far northern latitudes. Okay, so... We're going to actually move to the head now and add the various uh, features that give it its face. So we're going to add the eye. The eye of the salmon shark uh, is near the front of the snout, but uh, not quite at the tip. And it's, it's rather large, actually. And it's almost circular, it's very, very slightly oval shaped, uh, slightly taller than it is. Whoops, that's pretty bad. Then it is wide. Uh, my drawing is a little bit not so good that way. Let's just fix this up. But it is ever so slightly oval shaped, but it is mostly circular and it's very dark. When we look at it underwater, it's very, very dark. It does have a little bit of color, but mostly it's very dark. So you can actually pretty much fill it in with black if you like. Uh, that's the eye. Interestingly, they're placed in such a way that the shark actually has a little bit of what's called binocular vision. You and I have binocular vision. Our eyes are on the front of our face, so that we can the images from both overlap, and our brain integrates the image into one image that allows us to tell how far things are from us, this sort of three-dimensional aspect. And salmon sharks have a little bit of that binocular vision, which is really effective for an animal that hunts fast-moving prey, so it can judge the distance to the fish in front of it, so it can snap most effectively. That's really kind of a cool thing. Uh, sharks have nostrils. Um, mm, yep. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> We've got two questions in um, the Q&A, and one is, do orcas eat salmon sharks? And the other one is, do salmon sharks lay eggs or give birth? Yes. Heidi, do you have any um, input in this one? I do a little bit, and then I, it sounds like you know a lot as well. So I, yeah, you feel free to <laughs> jump in as well. But as you're drawing, I'm sure it's hard to talk at the same time. So you Just can get going. Bits and as we talk, but, but go for it. Yes, please do. Yeah. So um, the question about orcas eating salmon sharks. So we have different species, basically, of orcas here on our coast. So we have the residents that um, mostly eat salmon. That's what we're talking about. And they're largely like in the, the Salish Sea. But we do have offshore uh, orcas. They're often known as big killer whales. And these ones are often known to eat sharks. Direct stories of like uh, orca eating a salmon shark. I don't know specifics of that, but they are definitely much more like known to eat pretty much anything and the big things. And they are definitely big predators out there. So um, yeah, different, different diets actually for our different type of orcas we have here in BC. And then salmon sharks actually give birth to live babies, which is pretty crazy. 
I think that, that they're really adorable when like just baby sharks <laughs> the cutest thing ever um they look like miniature adults in many cases there are a few sharks that that have different proportions because like human babies our proportions are very different when we're born right our legs are very short our body is much longer our heads are big compared to our body we don't look like the shape of an adult but baby sharks by and large look a lot like they're adults but miniature so this like little 60 centimeter long babies that come out um and and they look like these mini great mini mini great whites but they're beautiful and they're they're different slightly different in color but they come out fully and and what's interesting is that yes they they basically kind of like lay eggs and the eggs hatch inside the 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 mother and the way that it works is they don't have like a placenta so the mother doesn't directly feed them with blood instead the mother produces additional eggs inside her body that are that are like just basically infertile eggs and the babies eat the eggs that are produced inside the mother and so it's the coolest thing these babies are eating basically uh eggs for breakfast every day inside the mother before they're born um and so it's it's a really strange way um that that sharks can, they have different ways of 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 giving birth or laying eggs very diverse group of animals. And these particular ones will eat uh, unfertilized eggs within the mother that she keeps producing as a way to basically feed them. It's the coolest thing. So here's the, so I've added the nostril. Basically think of it as kind of like a little bit of a, like an S shape. Uh, it has to do with, there's a hole, which is the actual nostril. They don't use it for breathing, but for scent. They are really effective at picking up scent underwater. But there's also a little bit of a flap that comes down. This all has to do with controlling the way the, the water flows over it. So they're most effective at picking up scent underwater. The mouth now we're adding, and I'm going to speed up a little bit here so we don't run out of time. You notice that um, with the mouth, the upper jaw, it looks like it kind of overlaps a bit of the lower one. Sharks can actually open their mouth pretty wide in many cases. Their jaws are not fused to their skull like our, like our upper jaw is. They're, both of their jaws can move somewhat independently of their skull. So they, some species can actually push their jaw out forward to snap at fish. Goblin sharks or viper dogfish are really great at this. They look amazing when they do this. Salmon sharks can also sort of have some independent movement, but um, they can open their mouth pretty wide. And so this sort of overlap shows that their mouth is mostly closed right now, but it can open pretty wide. I'm gonna add the teeth. Now, the neat thing about shark teeth is that there are so many forms of them and they're all evolved for their particular kind of food. So there's a group of sharks called horn sharks that eat mostly mollusks and other hard shelled animals. And they have these flat teeth in their back and then they crush things with them. Um, so their, their teeth are flat and, and, and not sharp. Great whites and others that eat uh, large things like uh, sometimes they will they will actually even eat um, the the carcasses of dead whales that are floating. So again, they're very important in recycling um, in the ocean. They have these massive cutting teeth, and salmon sharks eat um, salmon and other types of of fish. And fish are slippery, and so what you need for that effectively, and you'll see this in crocodiles, is teeth that are long and narrow. And uh, they don't have as much uh, cutting edges, but rather they are long and pointy so they can pierce uh, fish and not slide away. And so this is what salmon sharks have. They have these long, narrow teeth and they're a little bit hooked. So they grab the fish very effectively. So we're gonna put the teeth in. They actually point slightly outward in the lower jaw in the front. And so we're, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit if I can here, if the computer cooperates properly, and we'll show a close up what's happening here. So some of these front teeth, they're long and slightly hooked and narrow. They point outward from the mouth a little bit. And they're actually come in several rows. Sharks are really neat and they can replace their teeth very often. They're not like us where they have like, you know, one set of adult teeth that they have for their whole life. They keep losing teeth and growing new ones all the time, actually. Uh, their teeth are modified scales. Uh, they're called placoid scales. Their whole body is covered with these tooth-like little scales. And in their mouth, those tooth-like scales have been fused in and, and enlarged into what now we see as actual functional teeth. So really neat. Sharks wear their teeth on their body and they use their scales as teeth, basically. <laughs> so um, in the upper jaw, you can barely see the teeth pointing out because most of them are kind of covered by the shark's, uh, the soft tissues of the mouth. 
the lower jaw teeth are much more visible here because the shark is not actively opening its mouth and thrusting its jaw forward to grab fish here. You're actually in a much more sort of a relaxed state here. A lot of the time people draw sharks in very, very aggressive um, positions. And yeah, while they're hunting, they are, but uh, I prefer to actually show them sometimes in their sort of more natural, the, the way you often see them kind of a little bit more relaxed. So those are the teeth in the mouth. Sharks have gills, right? So those are, the way they breathe underwater is very different than the way we do. We have lungs, right? Sharks need to um, pull oxygen out of the water using gills, which are really heavily, um, they're, they're tissues that have a lot of blood vessels really densely in them. And so that the blood is very close to the surface of their of their skin. And that allows the oxygen to be taken up from the water, much lower oxygen in water than in the air. And for carbon dioxide, which is their waste gases to be um, to be lost. And sharks gills are protected under uh, the surface of their body. But the water has to exit. So the water comes in through the mouth and then exits through the gills. And as it passes over the gills, the air or this oxygen in the water is, is taken up by the shark's gills and blood. So they have these gill slits, which are the exit uh, holes, basically, where the water exits. And I love drawing shark gills. They're, they're anywhere from five or six or seven gills, depending on the species. Most sharks have five gills. And so the way we're going to draw them is there's five vertical slits along the side of the shark's body just behind its head. Uh, I'm just going to increase the size of this a little bit. Paintbrush, it's changed its size. So I'm just going to reset that. Yeah. So we're going to draw these vertical uh, gill slits coming down along the side of the body just behind the head. And there are five of them. And the water comes out backward through these. So they function to protect the actual very fragile, soft gills underneath, the gill tissues. Uh, and in being positioned right alongside the body, they actually also don't interfere with the shark swimming. And so there are these beautiful long gill sets. And salmon sharks have long gill sets. This is an indication, again, of a very active shark that needs lots of oxygen. It's using its muscles a lot. It's heating its body with its muscles. So that requires a lot of oxygen input. And so it needs a lot to be able to pass a lot of water over a lot of the, uh, the blood and the gills. And so the gill slits and the gills are very long. This is a wonderful example of, of how the shape of the shark relates to how it functions. And so those are the gills. Now we're going to add- Can I actually add a two second story about another cool shark I saw? Meanwhile, I'm just going to go on with the other fins and you guys just follow along and, and, and listen to the story here. Please do, yes. I'll make it a quick one. It, just because we were talking about the different functions of the gills, there's actually a shark who's known to be like an absolute gentle giant, huge giant uh, shark called the basking shark. And it actually has no teeth. Like you imagine all sharks are scary and predators and they have teeth. No, this is a, a shark that just goes slowly through the top of a water column and it feeds on all those little tiny like plankton and little animals that are living in the surface waters and it has special features near it like what you just draw to catch all those little tiny bits of food and that's actually how it feeds and I saw one once because this is another species that's been like fished almost to or killed um, almost to extinction in BC and uh, it was so cool to see this big, huge lumbering shark. You know, you think about sharks like this one that we're drawing today and it was so slow and it was just going along the surface and it just had its huge mouth open. It was just pulling in the food across the gills. So animals are weird. I love how animals evolve to do weird things depending where they live and what they need to feed on. So I different love... function, <laughs> yeah. That a wonderful that's a great example of another function exactly and then mm -hmm. the the other thing that that um that you you can't see from the outside right but that you would know is also there is the basking sharks as Heidi explained they filter out plankton from the water so they're not they're not hunting fish and such the same way but to filter it out they also have these very special um like little finger projections from inside of their the the cartilage and their gills called gill rakers and those help to catch the plankton and hold it and let the water go through it's like a sieve uh, it's beautiful how it evolved to do that and this i love basking sharks how they slowly just meander over the surface they're beautiful animals 
So if you ever have a chance to see one, wow, you'd be lucky. So that's wonderful. <laughs> so I'm going to add, so we've had put the pectoral fins in. Those are those front ones. They're actually uh, the same evolutionary um, origin as our arms. Okay? And so they function in sharks like the wings of an airplane. They allow it to, to, to ride the, the water and to not sink. Less power needed to keep it moving straight. Uh, and so they're really effective in, in cross-section. They look like an airplane wing. It's really cool. The pelvic fins are now, we're going to add them, and they are another set of paired fins. They're the equivalent of our legs. So uh, we land-dwelling animals evolved from uh, marine animals, aquatic animals, and they had fins. They had two pairs of fins that evolved into our arms and our legs. And the pelvic fins of sharks are these um, these fins that in in our the, the cousins of our ancestors that came out of the water are still fins, or rather the in in, in those cousins they became legs uh, or evolved into legs. But in sharks they kept them as fins, and they're also stabilizers in the water. As are two additional fins on the shark in this species. There's a second dorsal fin on the back near the tail, and what's called an anal fin underneath the shark near the tail. And those are tiny little fins, but again. Um, kind of like, you know how you have, have spoilers on, on sports cars and they modify the way that the water or the air flows over the car? Hopefully not the water, unless you're, you listen to your GPS wrong and drove into the water, which you really shouldn't be doing. But uh, in the air, it, the spoilers on cars modify the way the air flows and keeps it moving smoothly so the car doesn't experience much drag in the air. Same way with these uh, sharks, these little fins help to direct the water uh, around the shark's body and it makes it easier for it to swim. Okay, another superpower of sharks here. There's something called a lateral line. Heidi, would you like to talk about the lateral line while I draw it? Uh, oh. No, <laughs> you. I feel like you might be better at this one. <laughs> right. This is a cool superpower of sharks and many other fish. There's, and I'm going to draw this line and, you know, see, just start with from where we, the keel ends at the front end and then go along the body um, toward the front. It's a line. It's, it's, it's very well described. It's a line on the side of the shark, a lateral line, but there's a cool function for it. So it's actually a, a canal filled with liquid and it's, it's closed off. And what's really neat about it is it functions like our ears in a way. So when, when fish or when you slap around in the, you know, splash around in the water, you're making waves, not just on the surface of the water, but through the water, these compression waves. And so if you can, you can hear underwater a little bit, right? Because you can, you can actually pick up those waves in your eardrums. But sharks have a very sensitive way of picking up waves much more sensitively than any ears. And the lateral line, this canal of liquid on their side is what senses very, very slight vibrations in the water. And that allows them to determine the location um, of fish that are moving in the water. And of course, healthy fish, yeah, okay, it's a little bit harder to catch a healthy fish. But if you, there are certain kinds of patterns of vibrations created by fish that are injured, that aren't swimming properly or are flopping around. Those make much easier meals. And so sharks are going to look for that kind of signal. And so these lateral lines allow them to pick up the way in which different kinds of uh, movements are happening in the water. And so if a fish is kind of floundering around, a shark is gonna be attracted by that particular signal. And the lateral line is what helps them to pick it up. These super sensors on their sides. There's like super long ears basically down the length of the shark, but much more uh, sensitive than regular ears. So that's a really cool function. I love lateral lines. The last thing we're gonna to add to the, to the shark's body itself is its markings. And so you can actually color this in afterwards if you like, but I'm just going to show you what happens with um, with this shark overall. It has it's mostly dark on top and light underneath. And this is a very funky uh, feature called counter shading. Counter shading is where the upper part of the animal that's hit more by the sun is darker than the underside, which normally is in shade. And the dark uh, top and the light bottom effectively cancel out the animal's shadows when you look at it from the side. And so therefore it can hide in the water more easily from predators and from its prey and sneak up on prey more easily. So we're going to just kind of draw this kind of a, a, a wavy kind of a line um, that this 
kind of distinguishes where the dark meets the light. And it's kind of a very blotchy thing. And there's a little bit of a lighter white areas uh, on the front end of the um, the gills as well. And baby sharks of this species of salmon sharks have a very abrupt um, dark top uh, white underneath and a very sharp line distinguishing the two or delineating the two. But adults also have these blotches on the underside, on the lighter belly. So they're darker blotches. Uh, so they're not really perfect in terms of counter shading. But this blotchy appearance uh, may also help them, at least with other animals, blotchy appearances help them to blend in with other kinds of things in, in, in their environment. And there's many other reasons possibly for the blotchiness, or maybe it kind of evolved uh, as the shark didn't need that much counter shading. Because salmon sharks, live in waters that are often in the north here, they're kind of not that clear as in like, for example, the Caribbean where you have these crystal clear waters. And so they don't need as much to hide because the water itself is a little bit turbid or you know, full of stuff that floats in it, algae and other kinds of things. And so it's not, doesn't need a perfect way to hide, for example. The last thing I'm gonna to add to the shark here actually is something that we see in the video as well and um, that, that Heidi showed and that is very important for shark's health. They have parasites on their body. So this is not the shark itself, but this is part of the reasons why sharks might uh, rub on things to try to remove parasites that, that make them harder to swim or that take away food by you know eating some of the shark's actual blood or tissues. So there are these little invertebrates related to lobsters and crabs actually called copepods, a very special kind of parasitic copepod that lives on the shark's fins. And uh, you often see this in many shark species. There's like a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a blob at the back end of a fin. And then these two long sort of streamers coming out and they, they can actually build up in large numbers. Uh, and so these are parasitic copepods. There are also free-living copepods in the water. If you've ever looked in under a microscope or even just closely at water, you'll sometimes see these little tiny little oval-shaped things with these long, looks like arms, but they're antennae. And then they, they kind of push themselves along by flicking these antennae. And so these are copepods and those are the free-swimming ones, but there are also these parasitic ones. And so this has to do with you know, potentially why sharks rub on surfaces sometimes like in the video. They might want to remove some of these parasites because they actually cost them some resources. And, you know, they don't want to give away things. So there we go. So um, that's, oops, I just made a big, big line there. <laughs> so we don't need that line. I'll try to reverse this a bit back up and remove that silly line. Anyway, so sharks... Um, Currently, even though the salmon shark is doing well, sharks as a whole are experiencing an enormous amount of pressure from us humans. We hunt over 100 million of them every year of all species of sharks put together. Try to think about that amount. Uh, that's that's like, uh, you know, one eightieth of the entire human population. Basically, it's it's gigantic. 100 million, most cities don't have more than a million people. It's enormous how much we take in. They're actively hunted. They're taken as bycatch in, in nets that are meant for other species and then thrown overboard. They're they're killed sometimes because they're seen as, as competitors with, with um, uh, fish that we want to eat as our food. Um, there's many reasons in which they die. They also have destruction of their habitat uh, or as the ocean warms, and as the, as the world warms in general, as climate change proceeds, and the ocean not only warms, that changes the, the places where sharks can, can feed and where their food lives, but also as the carbon dioxide builds up in our atmosphere and dissolves into the water, it forms an acid. And that acid will also interfere with the shark's ability to make those special scales on their body. Uh, and they will therefore become much more susceptible to parasites. And so they're, they will start dying more. So we need to actively as much as we can um, act against climate change, reduce our use of fossil fuels and anything else that is contributing to it. Uh, we need to put very good regulations in place that the sharks aren't overfished. And this is where I think, Heidi, you've done a, a lot of work in, in, in determining how sustainable certain or, or, or 
you know, how, what kind of threats maybe there are to, to marine ecosystems? Yeah. Uh, the threats that humans can have on our ocean right now and ways to protect them and what work we can do together. And uh, yeah, it's a changing world and humans can change within it. So we have to remember that. So I think you brought up a lot of good points. <laughs> It's about trying to live with with our neighbors, right? It's respect. Uh, we live here. We enjoy this world, and we just want others to do the same. And also, they're very important for keeping our world the way it is and functioning. Sharks are very important in in, in ecosystems, and they get a far worse reputation than they deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, the old view of sharks being man eaters and, and vicious is so wrong. I've swum with sharks. I look forward to the next time I can. It is thrilling beyond belief. They are beautifully docile if you do things responsibly. And uh, it's amazing. You can't believe the, the experience of swimming with a shark. It's like, I mean, not interfering with them. Uh, you know, don't touch them. Don't try to follow them. But just to see them in their environment is magical beyond belief. So, and, and you've seen them, Heidi, from, from the research vessels as well. And when we went, I think I saw one as well on our research vessels, but it was, it's beyond belief amazing. So yeah, I totally geek out when I talk about sharks. And I hope all of you get a chance to see sharks in the wild, which you can. We have some amazing species on uh, on the West Coast of BC, for example, and several species. Mm -hmm. But I think that's where I'll leave it. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Heidi? No, yeah, thank you, Julia. You did a great job. I even drove it with you and I'm a horrible jar and mine looks pretty good. So thank you so much. And you hit all the anatomical features that I know about. So I felt like it's accurate and I can actually contribute to work now. And so that's great. Um, thank you everybody so much. You had some great questions in there and you seemed very engaged. So thank you. And um, yeah, I think that's about it for me. I a think huge it's thank you to too. you both. <laughs> Um, Julius and Heidi and everyone who joined today it makes um, my heart warm to see so many people want to draw salmon sharks and if you enjoyed drawing today we're doing another learn to draw November 22nd um, and that one's on wolverines and that should be pretty fun but if you want your drawings featured on our website you can email them to us but that will conclude our learn to draw today um, oh, thank you so much. oh no it won't Go ahead. We keep saying uh, that, that is useful that you can also use these drawings if you, and please do as much as you can, um, keep in touch with your government representatives, your MLAs, your MPs, uh, and, in, and if, in, if you're on a coastal city, your, your um, city councillors as well. Ask them to make really powerful legislation to protect these animals and their environments. And what you can do with your drawings is if you write letters, emails, or, or physical snail mail letters, is include a drawing that you did of the shark and say, here's some of the beautiful animals that we love on our coast and we'd like you to protect them and drawings are probably going to be uh make them remember the message more than just the the, the words alone i'm thinking so another thing you can do anyway that's it <laughs>